So here's our agenda. Um, we're gonna start off, Cameron is gonna talk to us about the overview of the Solar for Vouchers pilot program, what it's all about. And he's gonna highlight a few things that have also changed as we've been in development with the program. A couple things about timeline, geography, that kind of stuff. So he'll hit on that. And then we'll be hearing a little bit more about solar for multifamily buildings. Talk a little bit about incentives, case study, that kind of stuff. And then we'll hear more about the housing ah, choice voucher program and get a little bit of a 101 from Abdi Aziz. Um, and then we'll just come back together for next steps and your questions and comments. Um, our presenters this morning are Cameron Bailey uh, from the Met Council, um, Pete Lindstrom from CERTs of the Clean Energy Resource Teams, and Abdi Aziz Ibrahim from Met Council. So without further ado, Cameron, I will mute myself, advance the slide, and turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Lissa. Uh, thank you, everyone else, for joining this morning. Uh, quick audio check coming in okay? Beautiful. All righty. So, um, Focusing first and foremost, so y'all know what the intention is today, or at least our intentions for you today, uh, our goals. So first one, um, familiarize you, uh, those who were previously attended and who have not, with the how, the what, and the why for the Solar for Vouchers program. Uh, what's our intention behind this program? Uh, secondly, introduce you to who all is making this program possible and who will be shepherding you through this program should you participate. We hope you will, if it makes sense. And then lastly, make sure you understand what the next step is for participation if you do indeed want to continue uh, your participation in the program. Um, so those are our intentions. If that aligns with you, hopefully you'll be here as we advance to the next slide. Thank you, Alyssa. <laughs> so the Solar for Vouchers program is a technical assistance program designed to help multifamily rental landlords adopt solar energy and reduce their energy costs. Landlords can take advantage of these costs in exchange for commitment to rent some of their units to the Housing Choice Voucher Program participants. Um, and that's just like the really simple um, essence of the program. So when people are asking like, so how does it work? We help install solar for solar energy savings to your property and in exchange you help house uh, housing choice voucher holders. So how's the program structured? How do we make this work? Uh, it looks like this. The council facilitates the process of solar panel installation by assembling a group of uh, committed landlords and connecting them or you all uh, with solar developers who can install solar panels at competitive group prices. The Solar for Vouchers program offers a simple streamlined process of solar panel install, where program participants avoid the lengthy process of finding developers, evaluating the quality of their work, evaluating the quality of their reputation, negotiating competitive prices by yourself while also trying to learn what the whole landscape is in the first place. So instead of that route, <laughs> in this pilot program, we surround you with the solar technical, financial, and contractual expertise that the council inserts have to help empower you as landlords in your decision to execute a solar contract at this time or not. Alrighty, so what are the program benefits? Well, uh, considering this is the one we get, I think the most often, um, <laughs> the reduced solar install costs that comes with a group purchasing or, uh, or bulk buy program. Um, my uh, colleague Barish references the, the Costco uh, model a lot of the time. Um, secondly, with that, you know, that's on the install side, so construction costs, but then once it's installed, what are the benefits that can be realized? And a, a 10 to 30% range um, in overall annual electricity cost reduction is, is a pretty typical and common um, cost saving that's realized after solar PV systems are installed. Beyond that, as we were just referencing, expert solar technical, contractual, and financial expertise and assistance. As I say, it's not free, it's taxpayer funded. It's really, you're just getting something you already paid for. Um, beyond that, access to high quality solar installers at the most competitive prices. And that's how, that is the, the intersection that we really designed this program for. 
best quality at best price and really a, a, a combination of the two. And then lastly, that streamlined, transparent and cohort based solar install process. So when you ask a question in this program about how this could impact your business, the other people you're in this program with have the same questions are coming from the same lens of uh, analysis and um, with at very similar priorities and considerations. So that um, that peer to peer learning and kind of group thought. All righty. So why does the council pilot this program? And the council's last regional plan, it's called Thrive 2040. Uh, the council identified sustainability and livability as two of the five pillars of a thriving region. Uh, the Solar for Vouchers program simply serves both of those desired outcomes. And it does that by, as you see on the screen, advancing the adoption of solar energy and expanding the housing options of the region's low-income residents. Simply put, we want to help you house voucher holders by helping you reduce your electricity costs for the next 20 years. All righty. Um, and just on the front end of this, because we got this question a, a fair amount over the last couple of years of developing this program, we do accept tax credit and section 42 properties. Um, so just putting that disclaimer on the front end, uh, and in terms of what's actually on the screen, when people ask, all right, you want us to rent some housing choice voucher units, well, what, what are the broader conditions of that? Program participants are expected to rent at market rate, so whatever you're currently marketing your units at, the following number of units to housing choice voucher holders for five years. Now, that doesn't mean you lease to one tenant for a five-year period, but rather you prioritize that unit being occupied by a housing choice voucher holder. Because of course we know there's turnover every year. And you know, we um, we're structuring it so it's kind of in alignment with the size of your building. So uh, a building that would fall in that first range of number of units in the building. So if you have 10 units in your building or one of your buildings, you look at that. All right, I'm in that five to 20 range. So that means if I do this program, I install a solar PV system. I need to uh, prioritize the reservation of two units in my property to be occupied by um, voucher holders and so on and so forth. If you had like 45 units in your building, then it'd be prioritizing eight units for voucher holders over a five year period. And eligibility, and this is where I'm excited because this is our first update right here. Um, the, oh, okay, before I get ahead of myself. Let's just break it down. We have a map in front of us. So let's explain this map. The blue area is the area that is within the Solar for Vouchers program service area. The white is outside of the program. So if you're in that blue, which is most of Anoka County, Ramsey County, Hennepin County, uh, I believe a little bit of Carver County, um, then your property is eligible for this program, or that's the first eligibility. Now, uh, because this is this is a pilot, we do want to increase the odds of success in, in the solar contract meeting your business needs. So that's why we have these few specific requirements that you see on the screen. Um, so one going over that map, got to be in the service, the program service area. Secondly, no taller than five stories. After you get about five stories high, it really starts to complicate and increase the costs um, in a nonlinear way and you can read nonlinear is non-ideal. So kind of capping height at about five stories. Uh, beyond that, buildings with five or more units, and that's just because that common space in your buildings, that electric meter, uh, usually it's just not gonna be large enough to justify investing in a solar energy system. If you're, if you know, you have one master meter, all your units are sub-metered beyond having five units. Additionally, having five or more units makes your property eligible for additional finance mechanisms, which Pete will touch on here in a little bit. And that last one you see, structurally sound enough to support solar installation. Of course, you I, I'm not expecting that any of you off the top of your head are structural engineers and know what your roof can handle. That's totally fine. That is why we run this program to help walk through the, like there, there are processes to help find that information out and feel confident in that. And so 
program updates. Uh, so our first point to talk about them, and really these updates came from feedback from landlords when we did our outreach and engagement sessions in the fall, which again is why we do outreach and engagement, so we can learn. And what we learned is that we should change two things. So one, the Solar for Vouchers program service area now includes the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. My colleague Abdi Aziz will speak to the housing voucher component of the program shortly. And then the other thing is that you no longer have to be served by XO Energy to be eligible. Any electric utility provider is perfectly fine. However, there are different incentives available based on who provides you electricity, but Pete from CERTS will touch more on that. Actually, uh, I believe right now. Wow, look at that. Thank you so much, Cameron. It was a really great start and overview. Pete. That's my cue. <laughs> How about I go to the next one? Is that all right? Hey, that sounds great. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday to you all. I'm Peter Lindstrom with the Clean Energy Resource Teams. And these are just a few things I'm gonna to touch on over the next 10, 15 minutes or so. Gonna talk a little bit about why uh, multifamily buildings in the first place for solar and talk a little bit about some of the tools and resources that CERTS brings to the table here. And uh, as Cam mentioned, gonna talk about some different financing options and utility incentives and just cover a couple of case studies as well. So before I launch into that, CERTS, what are we all about? We are the clean energy resource teams and we have a long history of working with individuals, businesses, local governments, schools, to provide this type of technical assistance to help them make informed decisions on clean energy projects. And it's a real uh, pleasure for us to partner with the Met Council on this important project. So why solar in the first place? Well, Cam touched on it. Uh, you typically see in, uh, savings around uh, 10 to 30% or so is, is uh, pretty typical and the cost of solar has really dropped pretty dramatically in the last decade or so, uh, right around 70% or so. And with tax credits and accelerated depreciation and innovative financing tool, we can see the simple payback around eight to 10 years or so is pretty typical. So with these arrays being around for two decades, three decades, the savings can be pretty significant. It also can be a hedge against utility uh, rate increases. I think a conservative estimate is uh, rates going up uh, two to 3%, maybe even a little bit more. And with solar, of course, you're, you're purchasing less energy from the utility. So it's a, a great way to hedge against those unknown price increases. Got to talk about the uh, the curb appeal. You know, there's a there's a lot of folks out there that uh, want to live in a place that matches their values, and they're voting with their feet. and And solar sends a really strong message that this is a company that cares about the uh, about the building and and cares about the planet that we all live on it. And just like the renters, I, I think landlords. Um, care about the world that we live in. And uh, uh, you, you may be aware uh, across the, the globe, buildings are uh, uh, one of the biggest emitters of carbon. So when you're investing in solar, you're really significantly lowering your carbon footprint. And then I also wanted to touch on property values. You know, I put likely here in parentheses because there hasn't been any uh, concrete studies on um, how solar impacts property values, but there uh, there have been studies on on homes, um, and and uh, they have clearly shown that when that people are willing to pay more or pay or pay a premium on homes that have solar. So let's dive into some of the 
the tools and resources that we can bring to the table here. And that's really uh, our role in this effort is to help guide you to make a decision that's right for you, right for your building, and to make sure you're knowledgeable about the solar suitability of your site and your financial options to help you make an informed decision. So here's just a, a sample of our tools and resources. We have a, we have a site selection checklist and there it is right there. Um, so some sites may be more suitable for solar than others. And if you're considering solar, this site selection checklist provides information for you to consider, for you to assemble, for you to analyze as you really begin the process. And of course, a, a big part of selecting the right site is how much sun your site is going to receive. And a, a good rule of thumb is uh, if your uh, site gets about 80% or so unshaded. Um, and it, I got to tell you, there's a lot of things um, to consider here, uh, not just uh, if there's tall trees or tall buildings around, but also the mechanical equipment, uh, the surrounding roofs, the walls, roof access points, uh, gosh, all sorts of different things um, on your roof. So how can you determine how much sunshine your roof receives? We've got an app for that, and here it is. It is the Minnesota Solar Suitability app. And like it says here, it helps you find places suitable for solar and helps you take the next step. And if you punch in your address, it'll show something exactly like this. Uh, and um, like I said, a, a good, good rule of thumb is 80% sunshine. And this site shows 84% in the sun. Pretty, pretty great spot for solar. And uh, this, this doesn't take the place of doing a, uh, a site assessment. Um, a site assessment will be a, a critical component to this initiative. Next slide, please. Uh, the, uh, another part of choosing a, a great site is uh, your roof. And uh, the condition of your roof is really um, critically important in, in making this determination. And ideally, the, the best time is uh, when you have that, a brand new roof. Um, like I said, this, this array is going to be here for a couple decades, maybe longer, three decades plus. Um, so uh, a new roof is really the ideal time. It can be cost prohibitive, prohibitive to put up a solar array and, and take it down um, and uh, put the array back in place. So I've seen it where, uh, where people are scheduled to put on a new roof, say, in a couple of years, three years. Uh, and they'll uh, accelerate that roof replacement, understanding that they want to put on solar. So other big big ticket items on this checklist, including uh, include collecting your utility bills and understanding what rate you're on and factors to consider if you're thinking about a ground mount system as well. So let's talk financing for a minute. Good news here, we have a, a very healthy federal tax credit. It's at 26% this year that will drop next year down to 22% and then down to 10% following years. Uh, but a healthy 26% this year, as well as accelerated depreciation. So you can de depreciate the cost of that asset over a five year period. And that's advantageous as well. There's a program out there that multifamily uh, uh, building owners can take advantage of. It's called Property Assessed Clean Energy, and it's a loan program, Property Assessed Clean Energy or PACE financing. It's a loan program. It's for energy efficiency as well as solar projects. 
So you pay back the loan as an assessment on your property tax bill. And the interest rate for these loans is a very uh, competitive four and a quarter percent fixed over a 10 year period. It can be up to a 20 year term. Um, typically it's 10 years. Of course, cash is king and many, many, uh, many solar developers have um, relationships with lenders that you can take advantage of as well. And the, the uh, final thing I wanted to mention here is a, a power purchase agreement uh, or a PPA. This is available for, for businesses, for nonprofits, uh, and they can install solar arrays, solar arrays with no upfront costs. Uh, this is where a, a third party investor installs and owns and operates the system and your company agrees to purchase the power purchase the power that the array creates typically at a discount so lower than the rate that you are currently paying your your utility and and I should mention these are typically larger arrays so let's talk utilities. Uh, Cameron mentioned um, that uh, that that this program is uh, for the central cities and um, uh, northern, northwest, western part of uh, the region. And you can see across the the seven county metropolitan area, there's uh, I think the number is 15 different utilities that are out there and. And uh, whether it's Conexus on the north, Excel, of course, has the bulk of it, but there's cooperatives uh, on the western edge. Um, and there are different rules and regulations depending on what utility you are in or what type of utility you are in, meaning different rules and regulations for municipals or cooperatives or Excel, which is a investor owned utility. And so each provides just a little bit different incentives for solar uh, from little or no incentive to really quite significant incentives, financial incentives. And that's really part of the role of certs here is to help you pencil out uh, what these incentives mean for your project. So let's talk about Excel for a minute. Uh, Excel has some really healthy incentives. Um, because you're producing power. And that means that Excel or any utility doesn't have to create that power and, and assume those costs. So they provide incentives to homeowners and, and businesses uh, in Excel territory for the smaller projects, 40 kW or, or smaller, uh, they call it solar rewards. And for larger projects uh, above that 40 kW threshold, it's what they call the PV demand credit. And I also wanna mention if uh, two thirds of your residents are low income in individuals, then you likely qualify for a bonus incentive in Excel territory. And, and if that's the case, we can walk you through that option as well. We also have some calculators, uh, both if you're uh, uh, paying cash uh, for the array or going through a, a power purchase agreement, we have calculators that really can make uh, an apples to apples comparison uh, for the different proposals that may be before you. Next slide, please. We've got a couple of case studies. First one is the City View Apartments, really, really great project. Uh, and this one um, is in Egan, and you can see the solar really wall to wall on their parking lot uh, facility. It's a 145 kW project. Uh, back in 2016 is when they did this project. It produces 170,000 kWh, kilowatt hours per year. And to translate that, you can see this is a big facility that's about a quarter of the building's electrical load. So pretty significant. And since at view, um, at, excuse me, at home 
um, completed this project, they have completed 13 additional uh, at home solar arrays. So 14, 14 projects total. And all told, they anticipate saving about $2 million on these projects over the lifetime of the array. And just on this project, they're anticipating saving about $750,000. Pretty significant. Uh, on the, the uh, Liberty Apartments and, and townhomes in Golden Valley, an even larger project, 400 KW plus, uh, 452 kilowatt uh, array on Liberty Apartments and townhomes. This is in Golden Valley. Over a 1,400 different panels uh, atop 55 townhomes as well as a, a clubhouse and uh, a five-story apartment complex that they have there. And the energy um, generated by these arrays is uh, going to power the, the common areas uh, of the apartments. And um, it costs about a million dollars for, for these arrays. And it was financed by a mix of both cash and property assessed clean energy. It was part of a, a overall sustainability, a, a wide spectrum of sustainability efforts for these relatively new apartment complexes and townhomes. Um, and it's uh, anticipated that um, these solar arrays will displace over 5,500 tons of greenhouse gas emissions over the next 25 years. So really great project in Golden Valley. That's what I have and I'll, I'll pass it on, pass it back to, to Lissa. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, it's always good to have a couple of examples that people can reference um, and sort of under, like even getting a sense of like, how does that work on the roof? <laughs> Show me a picture. So thank you so much. And Cameron, um, you're gonna come back and walk us through a little bit about the steps in this program. Um, so maybe as you're coming back, I'm gonna do the first step, which is dun, da, da, da. <laughs> application. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> so first up, landlords are expected to attend an educational workshop about the program. What you're doing right now, just perfect. And as us why we're recording so others can view who couldn't make it. Um, then if you're still interested after learning about the program, you submit an application form, which has two components to move forward and officially enroll in the program. Uh, the first half of that form is a property owner agreement that expresses interest in participating in the program and sets out the program terms. So like the timeline and milestones. Um, and then the second component of that form is a site assessment checklist for each building that you're interested in entering into this program. Um, if you have five buildings and they're eligible, you can enter five buildings into this. If you have one building, you can enter one building into this. So just wanted to make sure we did explicitly state that. And that checklist is really for assessing the technical suitability of each property, um, having a sense of uh, what different incentives the, that property would be eligible for um, and getting a sense of uh, the technically feasible uh, size of a solar PV system. Uh, going to phase two, the council will be screening and pre-qualifying two to three solar developers through a council run RFQ process with our goal uh, being to bring you, as we said before, the most highly qualified solar developers at the most competitive price. Um, and just so you know, the solar installers will not be guaranteed a contract with any of you at the end of the program. Any contract that's executed is purely up to whether or not you decide the contract would work well for you. Moving on to phase three, property owners will receive technical assistance, which will inclu include uh, some of the following services. So helping coordinate solar developer site visits to um, analyze your property. Uh, providing general and site-specific contract review coaching with an eye toward contractual best practices, uh, educating property owners on solar financing and ownership options to empower you in the process and having um, you know, the full array of possibility. 
Um, and another one being to help uh, property owners find the contract that best fits their needs, right? There's different finance mechanisms and there's different types of contracts or ways to structure them uh, to better and best suit your business needs. And moving on to phase four, seller developers will extend their final offers to landlords for final decision-making. If you decide you don't want to sign a seller contract at that point, then you may exit the program with no penalties whatsoever. Um, so that, that, that's really how the program works in a kind of big phase flow. So timeline to the program. Um, as you know, first, attend the workshop, see how it works. Great job, y'all. Uh, second, submit your participation application by the end of May. So we reopen this application period to reflect the updates we made to the program. And basically we're opening it for the month of May uh, for additional landlords to enroll. Uh, we have two enrolled right now and working on a couple other applications. Um, and then, um, so yeah, submitting that application by the end of this month. And we went over that two components to it, agreement form, so terms and conditions, and then uh, giving us a sense of uh, what are the details of your property. After that, we use your application forms to inform our request for qualifications process, which enables us to select those two to three seller developers. Moving on to the fourth component, we'll coordinate site visits between um, you, the landlords, and the seller developers um, who would be interested in installing a PV system at your property. And for that time range, we're focused on August, September, October. Uh, just because it can be kind of tricky, coordinate dates and times. We're all in Minnesota in the summer, which means a lot of us leave the city in the summer. Um, so, you know, to honor that reality, um, crafting about a three month time period. Um, and then after that, we'll move into the final two phases of the timeline. So CERTS will provide support in analyzing and educating landlords on how to review and negotiate seller contracts. And if you see a contract you'd like um, and execute that contract, then we would expect you to get your so you can expect to get your solar panels installed with around within about a, a year. Uh, that's why you see uh, November 21 through October 22, because um, got to order all parts and materials that come from around the globe. Um, got to get through customs, get here, actually lay them out, the permitting process, interconnection process. There's a lot of processes to bring this all together, which is why we really try to put this on a tight timeline. Um, so that way we can prioritize everyone everyone's time in the program. Um, and, you know, really focused on, if we're all trying to move through the program together, we coordinate this together, it will be faster and uh, more productive for everyone as a process and in product for your business. And then lastly, over the same one year time period, um, begin to place your voucher holders. Um, so as you're waiting for solar panels to get installed and that system to get built out, also start um, um, prioritizing voucher holders uh, for the appropriate number of units at your property. Okay, so submitting an application. You know, we talked about before, just two components to it. Uh, this is the property owner agreement side. Um, and that really just lays out the timeline and process that I just walked us through. Lays out the terms and conditions. There's that table again to the right. So how many units you're expected to prioritize for voucher holders for that five-year period. And then letting us know who, who will be your main point of contact from, you know, basically May 31st <laughs> through November 31st this year. Um, again, so we can honor that timeline and process. Thank you. And then the site assessment. So you see three big buckets there. Physical property features, your preferred financing and ownership, and then your housing utility data. So physical features, those are things like your address, how many stories, when was the roof last replaced? Is it a flat roof or is it a pitched roof? What materials cover your roof? So is that a tar roof or asphalt, pea gravel, tile, et cetera? Uh, has there been any sort of history of leaks that you're aware of? So truly what we mean, physical features. And that finance and ownership side, as Pete brought up, um, are you interested in or do you even prefer debt financing? Are you interested in the PACE financing, property assessed clean energy? Um, are you interested in leasing 
um, the system over time uh, or a power purchase agreement? Or are you looking to lease to own the panels or just fully debt finance them? Um, what are your primary points of concern? So is it payback time and value? Is it the cost of financing? Is it the long-term operations and maintenance, liability concerns or roof damage and insurance? So really letting us know what are your priorities so we can be responsive to those. And then the housing and utility data side, provide the rental price point for your various unit sizes. Um, so what's your rental price point for your studio or efficiencies, your one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedrooms, all of that are applicable. Uh, arrange for how much tenants typically pay for the utilities at your property. And uh, at the very least, provide two utility bills, uh, one reflecting your utility bill in the summer and one reflecting your utility bill in the winter months for the common areas of the building. So we can have a sense of how PV systems would be able to be sized at your property. Um, and just as a reminder, we are here as program staff to help you find any and all of that information to really make this a, a really easy, seamless program for you all. Um, at that point, Lisa, I think, uh, can hand back over to Abdiaziz. And real quick, like folks, this is the website and we will also drop this into the chat after we're done with the presentation. Um, and there's a, an email for the program itself so that you know we can always make sure that it's getting to the right spot. But Cameron has graciously provided his phone number. So thanks, Cameron. Um, and Abdiaziz, thanks for joining us and for talking about the Housing Choice Voucher Program and making sure that people are up to speed on those details. Of course, good morning. My name is Abdi Aziz Ibrahim and I work for the Met Council, the Metro HRA division. Next slide. A Little bit about the Met Council and with what it does. I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with the Met Council. We run the largest Section 8 program in the state of Minnesota. We also run other services like wastewater treatment facilities, uh, bus and light rail services. Uh, we have uh, Metro Mobility and uh, we uh, also, uh, we have a department that uh, runs planning and research. Next slide. Today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Section 8 program also known as the Housing Choice uh, Voucher Program. That's actually where I work at, uh, Metro HRA. And uh, like I said, the Metro HRA has the largest Section 8 program in the state of Minnesota. We are actually in 100 cities. Uh, as you can see from the map, uh, the yellow part of the map is where we render our services at, and that is the entire uh, county of Anoka, Hennepin County, suburban Hennepin County, and suburban Ramsey County. We are also in Carver County. So the HRA, like I said, uh, has the hugest, huge chunk when it comes to administering this program. Um, this program is from HUD, Department of Housing and Urban Development, but we are uh, the local partner. Next slide. So in order for this program to be successful, um, there are three players, and uh, we, the housing authority, normally get into contract with the landlord. Uh, we signed a housing assistance payment contract with the landlord, which basically means we will be paying uh, rent every month directly to the landlord. And then on the other hand, uh, we have our program participants. The landlords uh, call them tenants, but we call them program participants. Then we also have uh, agreements with our participants. Uh, the landlord on the other hand has a tenant. So whether there's a landlord, there's a tenant, there has to be a lease. Um, so there's that agreement. So like I said, this program has these three important players for it to be successful. Next slide, please. I want to briefly describe uh, the responsibility of every player. Uh, I will start with the tenant. Uh, in this case, the participant, uh, they get a voucher from us, a Section 8 voucher, housing choice voucher, one and the same thing. They are supposed to go out and find a unit in the private market. So that's their responsibility. And we, the Metro HRA, the housing authority, we are supposed to pay um, 
a portion of rent directly to the landlord, like I said, if they have a portion, if they have a tenant portion, which is usually between 30% to 40% of their income, they are responsible to pay that. Uh, like any other tenant, they are responsible for their utility payments and they're supposed to follow uh, the rules and regulations as laid out in the landlord tenant lease. Next slide, please. So HRA, we are supposed to uh, pay directly landlord uh, the portion of the rent every month. Actually, it is the first or the second of every month. Uh, we are also to make sure the families are income eligible when they're getting the voucher and when they are in the program. So we recertify them once in a year. Um, HUD requires us to inspect these units, okay? At least once after, after every two years. So it's called housing quality standard inspections. Um, we are also supposed to make sure that our participants are complying with the rules of the program. Next slide. Landlord, uh, landlord collects rent. I think that's why they are in business. Uh, they are supposed to enforce lease. So uh, you're supposed, as a landlord, you're supposed to treat a Section 8 tenant like any other tenant. Uh, one of the duties of the landlord, which is very important, is to make sure if there are repairs to be made, then they make repairs. Next slide. Now, as a landlord, you might be asking yourself, why will you participate in the program? We at Metro HRA have gone a step forward. Gone are the days when we will issue a voucher and tell uh, families, go find housing. We are preparing a rent, our tenants to be smart renters. So you might be asking yourself, what is a smart renter? A smart renter is someone who uh, attends a tenant education workshop a financial literacy workshop to equip them with the knowledge that they need to be successful renters. So that's what we do here at Metro HRA. I and other outreach coordinators are always available uh, in case there is misunderstanding between landlord and tenants. We try our level best to mediate. Um, we, we, the outreach uh, coordinators, wear different hats. So we know file work, we know program eligibility, and we, uh, we are certified uh, inspectors. So we can go to units and inspect units. So you can get a lot of things by working with us directly as outreach coordinators. Next slide. That's my picture and that's how I look. Um, if you need to uh, get in touch with me, um, I will provide uh, my contact information in the next slide. But um, like I said, you know, uh, outreach coordinators are very, very important. So our job is to create good partnership with landlords. We recruit landlords, we, re we make sure we retain landlords and we want to increase uh, program, program participation for landlords. Now you might be asking yourself, um, I have a unit that I wanna advertise uh, where can I post that? Um, I will suggest you advertise on Housing Link, which is a nonprofit organization. It's a website. I'm sure some of you are aware of what this is. Um, so it's housinglink.org. And uh, if you advertise your unit on Housing Link, um, whether that is for Minneapolis or St. Paul or Metro HRA, then a lot of our, that's where normally we refer our program participants to look at for vacant units. Uh, so that's the first step. So if you have a unit in Minneapolis, so Minneapolis is run by a different of, uh, organization called Minneapolis Public Housing. Um, they do the same thing that we do. But if you have a unit in Minneapolis and you are wondering whether you should uh, rent out to a Section 8 voucher holder, I will strongly uh, encourage you to how to post your unit on housing link and someone from Minneapolis will contact you. The tenant themselves, they have forms and they will contact you with forms for you to fill out. And then those forms, once you fill them out, they will take to their worker in Minneapolis and their worker in Minneapolis will contact you to conduct inspection, schedule inspection and all that. Next slide. 
this is how uh, the housing link website looks like. So you go under landlords and property manager section, you click on that, and then you put the detail of your unit there, the address, how much the rent you are charging, who is responsible for which utility, all that fun stuff. Next slide. So if you have a unit in St. Paul, St. Paul has a different office. It's called St. Paul Public Housing. They are in downtown St. Paul. You do the same thing. You go to housinglink.org and you advertise there. And if you get uh, a phone call or an email from a prospective tenant, then um, you, you will get those forms from those tenants and then you will fill out. It's actually called a request for tenancy approval form. Once you get that form, um, then uh, the tenant or you can actually fax back that information to the housing authority, in this case, St. Paul, and St. Paul will contact you to schedule an inspection. Next slide. So um, if you wanna talk to me uh, about our program guidelines and how it works, I will be more than happy. Please get in touch with me. My information is on the screen. That's my email my office phone number, and my cell phone number. Thank you. Abdiaziz, thank you so much. And thank you for really walking through the details <laughs> about how the whole process works. I think that that's always really helpful. And I know for myself, um, having heard from you before, um, hearing it multiple times matters. So having it recorded will, I think, be of benefit to folks. So thank you so much. Um, Cameron, now I think we want to go to questions. Um, I, I have actually two that I'm going to um, have to start us off. Um, and I welcome the rest of you. Put your questions in a chat or even just put on your video and unmute and feel free to ask it. But the very first one is you talked about um, for the different sized buildings. So it, you were talking about the 5 to 20, and then it's two voucher holders, reservations for two voucher holders. Will you say a little bit more though, because it's above and beyond those that you might already have. Is that correct? Maybe you could say a little more. Yeah, totally. Yeah, definitely um, above and beyond those which you have. So um, a lot of the applicants um, who we've received have said like, okay, well, I have some project-based voucher unit um, units at my property. And then I already have some section eight voucher units, and then I have some market rate, and then I have some other. Um, can I count the ones I already have toward this or do I have to add new ones? It's like, yeah, the idea is that we're expanding the amount of, uh, or the number of units that house Section 8 voucher holders. So it would be above and beyond what you currently have. Super, thank you. Yeah. And then you you made a little reference to this when you were presenting, but have there been properties that have already sort of thrown their hat in the ring and what are you hearing from them about the project? Yeah, so we have, uh, it's a big number crunch or filtering process, if you will. <laughs> so um, at this point we've had about 50 folk reach out to me in one way or another, um, expressing interest in the program. And then that's why we screen for eligibility. After screening for eligibility, <laughs> um, initially, that number got squeezed down to more like 12. Um, and then, and that was before submitting an application. And so after kind of like just a phone call or quick email, um, then folk who, uh, it made sense to submit an application after that, they went ahead and submitted those in. And then from that 12, we ended up with two people or people, two landlords and two properties that are currently enrolled in the program um, that met all the eligibility criteria. That's also a big component why we expanded the program um, with electric utility service area and being in being able to be eligible in Minneapolis St. Paul, because that's where majority of those landlords who were interested that's why a majority of them uh dropped out and you know a couple also the rents they were the rent points were just too high for our voucher program um so you know that's why we do all that pre-vetting so i can let you know in three to five days rather than after three to five months perfect so 
questions from other folks. We also have some questions for you. So, <laughs> uh, but I want to make space for folks to ask your questions. Yeah, Brian, go ahead. So I did have a question and I was just wondering if you could share some guidance surrounding new developments that aren't constructed right now. And I know the timeline is so tight, but we, we so we're developing a property right now in St. Louis Park. And we were very interested in kind of including this in some of the planning processes. Um, I mean, we are not really close to breaking ground at this point, but we did want to start incorporating some of the stuff in our planning. Can you give some guidance around kind of what that process would look like? Yeah, absolutely. And so um, we actually have a couple other affordable housing developers right now. Those are, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of our tentative applicants because they're like, well, we have, you know, like five projects lined up for the next five years. Um, and this would make a lot of sense for those. And so our answer is yes. Um, currently not constructed, but future planned development projects are absolutely eligible for the program. I realize I just said absolutely eligible, shaking my head no, are absolutely <laughs> eligible for the program. I gotta line up my, my body language with my verbal language. <laughs> and so Cameron, say a little bit more to Brian about how that would work because you wouldn't necessarily know how much energy usage yet or some of those things. So do you have True. other thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah. So with that, we do know, you'll know how many units you have. Mm -hmm. And with new construction and current building code standards, we also have a sense of how much tenants electricity costs would be on an annual basis. But then also because construction, um, current building codes, and we have new construction every year, we also have a sense of what your common space master meter utility load will look like. Um, and then also, if you're got a new building in development, you also already have a sense of your site plan. So the size of your roof, location of your HVAC systems, um, where your uh, emergency easements and um, walking paths need to be for access to equipment on the property. Um, your electrical plans, you'll know where your electric meter and box and uh, transformer, all that, where, all your components will be located. So um, yeah, and, and you don't have to know all that right now, right? because we're also not coordinating site visits till later on in the summer. So if you think your project uh, may even be far enough along by that time in the year, I'd say it's totally worth enrolling in the program because also, as we said, we're trying to impart what we know to all of you as landlords. So if this year isn't the right year, but now you know what are the right conditions under which you or your employer would execute a solar PV contract, that's also a win for us because we're building knowledge and capacity within our metro community. That's great. Thank you, Cameron. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> uh, hey, Henry, hey. go ahead. Yeah. So with the change of allowing uh, uh, participation in St. Paul and Minneapolis, how does, does that change the relationship with Metro HRA? Because um, we're not in, because those cities aren't in their service area? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, great question, Henry. Um, wondering if Badish or Abdi Aziz would like to uh, field that question. Or if you want to advise me, Badish, to go ahead. Oh, sure thing. Um, great question, Henry. Um, we are, for the service area in Metro HRA, we have our own direct outreach coordinators working with you. With uh, and the working relation is established between the outreach coordinators and the, um, the landlords or property owners. In St. Paul and Minneapolis, we um, expect you to work with the Metro uh, Minneapolis PHA or St. Paul PHA, and you're simply asked to um, market your properties, uh, your units on housing links. So the, the part of the work that needs to be done is just simply to um, provide the or make make the units available on the housing link website, and the rest of it, it's your uh, tenant will be bringing you the paperwork, and you just simply work with the PHAs instead of Metro HRA. Does that uh, answer the question, Henry? Yes, thank you. Yeah, and we're here. Our, and Badish, thank you, great response. And Thoreau, I was like, yeah, Badish should answer that. Great question also, thank you, Henry. Um, and with that, 
we as the staff running the program are also here as well to help make that process as smooth as possible. So that's why we say just submit the applications to us and we can do that, not can, but we will do that screening for um, uh, pricing eligibility with the different housing authorities. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Other questions, Joan, got any questions? Hi, welcome, you're still muted. Thanks. Um, I'm not a landlord, um, but I'm active in two ways. Uh, one through St. Paul 350, which is a grassroots clean energy advocacy group, and um, also as a neighborhood activist. And so you may say, let's talk offline, but um, the first question is, uh, uh, I understand this is a pilot. Is it expected to be open again next year, or are we really working just with this very tight timeline you described today? Great question, John. Thank you. Um, so that kind of remains to be seen. How we're designing it as a pilot program is, let's see uh, how the program actually unrolls as we currently have it designed. And if it rolls out smoothly and well, the idea is also that this is a program that would ultimately be available at the very least to the whole metro area. Um, to do that, we need more staff support. <laughs> we need more basically staff support to run it for the whole metro area. So it's also a way of kind of proving proof of concept and the fact that there is demand for this program, sustained demand for this program year over year. So before we commit to running again next year, we want to make sure how we currently have design does indeed work. And if that works, then reach out to the applicable powers that be to help scale it in a way where the, the efficacy of the program isn't compromised just to be able to say we're running it again or at a larger scale. So very much a pilot. Let's see what we can learn and use that to inform how we should move forward. Understood. Um, so just a couple of follow-ups to that. One, um, you know, St. Paul 350 and, and through our neighborhood district council, we might be able to help spread the word. I don't know how widely known this is. Um, uh, so I think spreading the word now uh, for um, St. Paul 350 is maybe not gonna make sense, but in terms of the neighborhood, when district council um, housing committees are reviewing developers, even developers that have a work in progress, it might still make sense for the neighborhood to be saying, we would really like you to apply for this in addition to kind of reviewing your variances or whatever. Um, does that totally. make sense or am I thinking crazy? Um, I think that drives, absolutely. Um, and there's, there's definitely precedent for that with other things. So saying, looking at the, um, um, oh gosh, no, the green green overlay, the Minnesota, oh gosh, what it is, it's, it's for efficiency sustainability standards. Um, green Step City thing, no? Not Green Step, more so for developers in um, affordable housing development and some of the different grant programs. Uh, Minnesota Green Communities overlay, but yeah, it's more so for guidance. Yes, Lisa. okay, yeah guidance on um, building design construction standards. So that's pretty normalized, um, at least in our, our grant making program for um, affordable housing development. And I, I see more cities uh, referencing that or uh, SB 2040, um, or is it SB 2050? I'm forgetting now, the smart building. I think SB 2030. <laughs> 2030, oh, You're a man. decade ahead of yourself. <laughs> man. That's a weird thing with Met Council. We're always like 20 years down the line. So we're already the 2050 plan, which is wild. What is time? Um, anyway. So yeah, I, I'd say there's absolutely precedence for that, Joan. And that'd be that'd be wonderful to push that out there. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And Joan, I want to just also say, I mean, thanks for bringing up these questions and, and even sort of pathways for communicating with folks because, I mean, as a pilot, I think there's, I mean, we're trying to do as much learning as we can about how to make something like this successful. So 
all of those things I think are informing both right now, but can inform, you know, pathways into the future, depending on how things go. So we really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, other questions from folks? I don't want to cut anybody off. Okay. You're more than welcome to come on anytime. I'm going to drop the link to the program in. And then Cameron, do we want to pose a couple questions to the group? Yeah, yeah. Well, in the spirit of this being a pilot, we'd love to get some data back from you all in the form of if y'all could answer um, three questions for us. And I will drop those in the chat and then read them aloud. So the first one being, what is one thing you like about what you heard this morning about this program? What's one thing you like about this program? Secondly, anything that's a concern or that you don't like about the program or don't quite understand about the program? You know, so sometimes you hear that of, uh, give me a rose and a thorn, a good thing, bad thing, um, but more so something you liked and then something that maybe gives you concern or pause or confusion. And then the third, third, third thing, um, is there anything that limits your ability to participate? Um, as you as you've seen and understand the program and how it's structured. Um, so modeling this, um, we y'all can drop this in the chat. I might say something I like about um, this program. What I've heard this morning is that um, it's open to people not served by Excel. You know that opens up Anoka County. That's great. Um, a concern that I don't necessarily, a concern I may have or something I don't quite understand. Um, let's say uh, I don't understand how time works generally. So uh, I need help understanding the timeline. Or this is a much, uh, much more well-grounded one. Thank you, Henry. Yeah. Challenge with solar is the age of our roofs. Absolutely. A challenge of this program is the fact that many of our sites are already 100% subsidized. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and do you see Bro's initial um, explanation of the tools? I think is something mm -hmm. Bro was saying, I like this about the program, but the challenge being landlords with units in different locations. Mm -hmm. Maybe, Bro, if you're willing to, might you be willing to say a little bit more about what you mean by that? Uh, what I mean by that is that if a landlord sees the requirement is to have five or more units uh, to be qualified. So if the landlord does not have like the five units in one location, uh, mm -hmm. does that mean being disqualified? Right, right, got you. Um, I mean, functionally, yes. I don't want to say you're disqualified, but it's like, I would put it as you're not eligible, but you're right, it, 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 that, that is a barrier to being qualified for the program. And you're not the first person we've heard that from, uh, unfortunately, but it also has informed us uh, for this program that if, you know, in terms of our lessons learned from this program and things that we just learned generally, that it'd be a great idea to have a program that's targeted toward units or properties with you know, one to four units and another program targeted at properties with five or more units, um, just because the, the economics and the process of it are just different enough. It's hard to run both size properties um, in the same program. Um, so it kind of takes away from being able to run it on a tight timeline um, that can, you know, it is more likely to be able to actually stick to the timeline. So unfortunately, Yes, um, all five units need to be at one building, that minimum five units. Um, so. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing I would add, and thank you so much, Cameron and Bro, thanks for bringing that up. Um, CERTS does have just general resources about how to move forward with solar. And my colleague Pete and I um, are both happy to be resources and I'll drop my email into the chat and Pete, maybe you could drop yours into the chat as well. 
Um, we have, you know, other tools that will help at sort of those smaller size buildings and we, and we are happy to do some of that. There are also some other entities that run programs um, sometimes for, you know, sort of single family and they, they might be an opportunity. So there's a program called Solar United Neighbors and another program called the Midwest Renewable Energy Association that sometimes for single family have done um, uh, sort of joint action programs, not unlike this, um, but maybe with a different focus. Um, but I think that they could work for, um, you know, two to four units as well. So that might be another option. So just reach out. Are there questions from folks? Uh, Joan, yes, interesting. So I don't, Kim, I don't know if you can see this, but one of the concerns that Joan just expressed was the linked, linked to supply of vouchers and will the voucher program expand? Mm, mm. So I'm gonna start this and then ask Barish and or Abiziz to help uh, finish <laughs> this response. So the major impetus behind this program in the first place for us was we have a backlog of people who qualify for a voucher and then aren't able to get placed with their voucher. And it takes a long time to get through that list to get your voucher. And then if you're not able to place within a certain window, you lose it and you have to start that process all over again. So that's really the intent of this program um, at the front end is you know expand affordable housing in the sense that we don't have enough units to place all the voucher holders that we have. Um, but Ish, I think you had a statistic at something like 40% of people who receive uh, or who are approved for a voucher aren't able to use it. In, or is it 60? It, yeah, it's only, they could only place 56% people if they cannot find a unit within 120 days, they lose their voucher. So we have a huge backlog of folks who are trying to find a unit. So property owners will never have trouble finding voucher holders. There's plenty around. Yeah. And honestly, if we got to the point there were no more voucher holders and y'all getting leased to voucher holders, that is also considered a win. <laughs> Super, thanks. Um, any other observations from folks to Cameron's earlier questions, anything else that you have that's a, I like this, keep this going, or a concern or something that's limiting your participation? I know we're coming right up on time, but I want to make sure we catch anything else that people wanted to share. Okay. Well, I really wanna just thank all of you for joining us. Um, I did get a couple of um, questions in the chat earlier saying, you know, I have to leave early or I came in late. Can I get the recording? Absolutely. Um, we will be sending that out to everyone uh, who registered. And if you are here now, we will <laughs> make sure that we get it to you. Um, in addition, I'll just encourage folks, I dropped the um, program website link and that's always a great place to start if you have some questions and just wanna dig through it. And, and just as a reiteration, the team is here to help you. And so if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna just praise the Metropolitan Council team because they have been just picking up the phone. Um, and it is, it's hugely beneficial, I think, to just have folks like Cameron and Barish and Abdiaziz who can answer your questions and and then you get the question answered and you move on, right? You're not waiting for weeks and weeks and weeks to figure out, is this a good fit for me or not? And this is an amazing team of folks working on this who really want to see it be successful for you and are happy to field your questions. So thank you, my council folks, for all of your work pulling this together. It's really, it's tremendous to work with you and I appreciate all of the work that you're doing. To all of you who are have attended, thank you for your email addresses. We will be doing that follow-up uh, and we really, really, really hope that you'll consider putting in an application. <laughs> really, really, really. Okay, uh, Cameron, any final words? Uh, just big thanks. There's my email down in the chat. I'm the Aziz's as well. Pete dropped his as well, Lissa as well. Really you can reach out to any of us because we do function and operate as a team around this project. So whatever pathway is easiest for you to get in touch with us, please do. 
Um, happy to take any and all phone calls, emails, and typically turn that around in about a day. Um, so yeah, again, May 31st is the application deadline. Um, so that still gives you a but you don't need to feel intimidated uh, by the process or prospect of the program. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we have a few, but we would definitely love a few more um, enrolled in the program. And thank you all for showing up on a Friday, Friday morning. Happy May. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.